Hi, I'm Chris Cluey, lead designer of Twilight of the Gods. With me is Chris Morgan, one of the other designers on the game. And today we are going to demo a version of Twilight of the Gods for you. These will be two slimmed down 30 card tutorial decks with which we will show you the mechanics of the game, how to play it, and what makes Twilight of the Gods so unique. So strap in and enjoy, because this is going to be fun. All right, so we are going to be demoing a game of Twilight of the Gods. Uh, normally decks are 50 cards, but for the purposes of this tutorial, they will only be 30 cards, and it will be scripted. The uh, starting hands will be set up in advance and then the first couple draws. So that way, we can show you how all these mechanics work, you can see them play out, and then near the end of the game, you can see some pretty cool interactions that occur at higher levels of play. So without further ado, let's start the game. You start by drawing seven cards. Seven. Now, normally you can take a full seven card mulligan if you wish, if you don't like the cards in your hand. We recommend you have at least two or three tier ones in your hand, which are these guys, because you will need to trade away one of those to your opponent, at least one, and you want to have something you can actually play. Um, so this would be a very good starting hand. I have four tier ones, two tier twos, and one tier three. This gives me lots of options of cards both to trade as well as cards to play. Now, for the purposes of this demo, Mars, my opponent, will be going first. On the first player's first turn, they draw one card. Every turn thereafter, we will each be drawing two cards. So, the turn order itself is, first is the refresh phase. My opponent refreshes any exhausted aspects and creatures he, he or she has out in play, and that makes them available to use again. Since this is the start of a game, there's nothing in play, nothing needs to be refreshed. Now we move to the draw phase. This is where you will draw one card. Card in hand, all right. Uh, there is no max hand size limit in Twilight of the Gods. That is because in this game, since your life stack is your life, when you lose the last card in here, you're dead. That's it, you're, you're gone. So you can draw as many cards as you want, but just remember you're taking damage when you do that. So after the draw phase, we move to the trade phase, one of the first unique mechanics of Twilight of the Gods. Now in order to get resources from each other, we have to trade cards with each other. Uh, normally, since it is my opponent's turn, he would say, I'll trade you a tier one for a tier one, and then I could choose whether or not to accept that. It could even be I'll trade you a tier one and a tier two for a tier one and a tier two. I could choose to accept that or not, or make a counter offer. Trades also don't have to be one to one, they can be asymmetrical. He could say, I'll trade you a tier three for three of your tier ones, and then it would be up to me if I wanted to accept that trade or not. But for the purposes of this demo, we will be doing scripted trades. Um, now, the other thing with trading is normally you don't know what you're getting from your opponent. This is important because they could be setting up a trap for you that they're going to reveal later on. However, we will know what we're getting. Again, scripted demo. So, my opponent, you will be trading me a Cauterize in exchange for my heal, both of which are tier one cards. After we trade the cards, they go into our aspect stack. Make sure you don't look at the card after your opponent gives it to you. It's a natural reaction. <laughs> Try to avoid doing it. It's okay if you do it the first couple of games, but yeah, eventually you want to get to where you just take it, put it in your aspect stack. After the trade phase is the seize phase. During the seize phase, if you hadn't traded with your opponent, or if your opponent refused to trade with you, you could then ditch cards from your hand in order to seize a resource from your opponent's hand. Now this comes at a cost though. In order to seize a tier one from your opponent, you have to ditch three cards from your hand, one of which will be destroyed permanently. If you want a tier two, it's four cards, one of which will be destroyed permanently. A tier three is five cards, one of which will be destroyed permanently. It's your choice as to which cards you get rid of. It doesn't matter what tier levels they are. All that matters is the number of cards. Now, as you can see, this can be potentially ruinous to your hand choices because if I seized a tier three, I would only have one card left. So usually you want to seize later on in the game. However, since we cooperated during the trade phase, we cannot seize because you cooperated. So we will skip the seize phase. After the seize phase is the resource phase. That's where my opponent will choose one of his or her aspects to put into play. If they have more than one aspect in their aspect stack, they may choose which one goes into play. However, they must put one into play. The limit on aspects that can go into play per turn is one. So you will be placing your tier one into play, very good. That aspect is now available to be exhausted to provide power, which will allow you to play cards from your hand. After uh, the resource phase, we move to the summoning phase. This is where you actually get to play cards from your hand, bring things out on the battlefield. So, um, my opponent will be playing a sand dune. Uh, in order to do that, you need to exhaust your tier one to provide one tier one power, and then you'll put the sand dune down into the field of play. 
Yes, and as Sandun is a fortification, it has a location listed on it, south in this case. As you can see, my opponent has placed his fortification in the correct location. It will now give an ongoing benefit, which in the case of Sandun is creatures that attack, um, lose Relentless, and suffer minus one fight, minus zero life until end of turn. Now, an important thing to remember in Twilight of the Gods is that when creatures attack each other, they use their fight value. When creatures attack you as a player, so targeting either your life stack or your discard stack, they use their current health as the damage they deal. So it can be worthwhile to chip down bigger creatures because damage is permanent in this game. This will cause those creatures to deal less damage to you over time. After the summoning phase is the combat phase. In this game, creatures cannot attack the turn they come out because they're too busy getting acclimated to the battlefield. They can, however, exhaust for abilities. So when you play a creature, if it has a little symbol that says rotate this card, then do an ability, you can use that the turn it comes out to play. That being said, there are no creatures out in the field, nothing to do during combat, so we skip to the end phase. During the end phase, any cards that are manifested, that means a resource that has been flipped face up, will now flip back face down, it will be randomized, and then the game will proceed. Um, any other effects that occur during the end phase will occur then too. So, that is the end of the first player's first turn. Now I will run through the same turn order, and we will go back and forth until one of us loses the game. So, my refresh phase, I have nothing out. My draw phase, I will now draw two cards, because it is no longer the first player's first turn. Um, now we move to the trade phase. I will be trading a Mob Justice in exchange for your Wildfire. We go face down. This goes into my aspect stack. That goes into my opponent's aspect stack. As you can see, so now we skip the seize phase because we traded, move to the resource phase. As you can see, I have two cards in my resource, uh, or in my aspect stack. I choose which one of these I want to put out. Now early game, I want to put out the tier one because this is more likely to get me a creature out that I can use to protect myself. So that's what I'm going to do. Summoning phase. I will exhaust my tier one to put into play a Dragon's Tooth Soldier. Now this is a, a creature with one fight and two life, which means it can deal one damage to other creatures and it can suffer two points of damage in return before dying. Um, when it hits a life stack, it will deal two damage if this is its current, current life of two. If it hits a discard stack, it will deal half its current life rounded up. So it would be able to destroy one card out of a discard stack if I chose to attack that. This card also has a special ability that if it is in your discard stack, you may destroy, destroy is removing something from the game, you may destroy another creature in your discard stack in order to return this into play. And if I get to do, if I do that, I also get to manifest one tier one, which means flipping a tier one resource face up, resolving the effects on it, and then during the end phase it will flip back face down. So this is a card where if this was in my discard stack, and you saw it there, you might want to attack my discard stack instead of my life stack to get this card out of the game. Otherwise it's just going to keep coming back, and you'll be very sad. Combat phase. I cannot attack with this card as it just came into play, so I will pass my combat phase, I will go to my end phase, nothing is manifested, nothing needs to be resolved, we will go to the next turn. So, it's now your turn. Refresh phase, very good, it becomes refreshed. Draw phase, draw two cards, very good. Now we go to the trade phase. Um, you will be trading me a Wandering Hermit in exchange for my Leper Quarter. So a tier one for tier one, there we go. All right, goes in the aspect stack. We skip the seize phase because we traded. We, we move to the resource phase. You will be placing the tier one resource into play, thus giving you two tier one resources to generate for power. Now, in this situation, you're going to exhaust both of those two tier one resources. And there are two choices that my opponent could play here. They could use either a flaming arrows to deal two damage to my dragon's tooth soldier, or they can summon a reflection of Ishtar, which is normally a two fight, one life creature. Now, the thing is, is that while the Flaming Arrows would kill my, my Dragon's Tooth Soldier, generally you want to get creatures out on the field early on, so that way they can start battling your opponent, protecting your own life stack, etc, etc. So, my opponent will play the Reflection of Ishtar. And the reason why is because the Reflection of Ishtar also has an ability, if you control a Sand Dune when you summon this card, place two Blessing Markers on this card. Now, Blessing Markers are plus one, plus one counters. A creature can have a maximum of three Blessings on them at any one time. So what that means is, because the Sand Dune is in play, the Reflection of Ishtar is now a 4-3. It has 4 fight and 3 life. That makes it significantly more powerful than my Dragon's Tooth Soldier. I might be in trouble. Alright, uh, we move to the combat phase. Uh, reflection of Ishtar cannot attack because it just came in. We move to the end phase. Nothing happens because there are no manifested cards. Now we move to my turn. I refresh first, so that is refreshed. I draw two cards. And then I am trading Emperor's Decree in exchange for Total War. There we go. 
So that is a tier three card. Now, when you look at tier three cards, pay attention to the little black box on the bottom, because what that means, that's its heresy effect. And generally as cards power levels go up, they become more powerful, both in terms of what the card itself does and in what the heresy effect does. So the heresy effect is, is the trap essentially that you're setting for your opponent. So you want to keep in mind both when you traded that card to your opponent, as well as where they put it out into play, so you can reveal it at the appropriate time later on. All right, we skip the seize phase, again because we traded, now we move to the summoning phase. I'm going to put out my tier 1 resource, I'm going to exhaust this tier 1 resource in order to put out a Borderland Scout, which is a one fight, one life creature with stealth. Stealth means it cannot be blocked by other creatures. Now here's where we explain two very important concepts in Twilight of the Gods. First concept is the idea of creature limit. With creature limit, I can only have out as many creatures of this level as I have resources of this level. So, if I was to exhaust this tier 1 and play these Stoic Legionnaires from my hand, which I have the ability to do, as soon as they hit the battlefield, I would immediately have to kill one of these cards in order to get back down to creature limit. Now sometimes that can be worth it. If, for example, your card has a deathbound keyword, that means when it dies, you get to do something you can absolutely trigger that with Creature Limit. So if you had two creatures out, you played a third one, and one of those creatures had Deathbound, you could choose to kill that creature to make its Deathbound trigger go off. However, mine do not have that, so it is not worth it for me to play that third creature. The second important concept in Twilight of the Gods is the idea of sacrificing. Now in this game, we have very few counterspells. Instead, what we have is that any player at any time can destroy any card in play or any card being played by sacrificing resources equivalent to that card's printed summoning cost. So what that means is that if my opponent wanted to get rid of my Borderland Scout, had no other way to do it in his hand, but absolutely had to get rid of this, he could sacrifice one tier one resource and that would destroy my Borderland Scout as it has a one tier one printed cost. Both of those cards are now permanently out of the game. My opponent is down a resource, but I have lost my Borderland Scout. If I wanted to do the same with Reflection of Ishtar, I would have to sacrifice two tier one resources as it has a two tier one printed cost. Sacrificing is very powerful, it can also be very dangerous, because in a game where the only way to get resources is trading with your opponent, if I go down two resources, my opponent is probably not going to want to trade with me. So you need to figure out the right time to sacrifice and what key piece of your opponent is most important to stop. Okay. Uh, that was the summoning phase, now we move to the combat phase. Now I could attack with my Dragon's Tooth Soldier, but since his Sand Dune gives my attacking creatures minus one fight, that would effectively make my Dragon's Tooth Soldier a 0-2 creature, in which case he could block with his Reflection of Ishtar, take no damage from my 0 fight Dragon's Tooth Soldier, and kill it in return, thus netting me nothing. Um, when creatures attack in Twilight of the Gods, you declare all your attackers at once, and you declare what they are attacking either the opponent's life stack or the opponent's discard stack. The opponent then chooses what they want to block with if they want to block at all. Blocking can only be done on a one-to-one -one basis. You cannot block multiple creatures into one attacking creature. It's just one-to-one. -one. So I will choose not to attack with my Dragon's Tooth Soldier because I think that would be a bad trade. I'll move to my end phase. Nothing to resolve. Nothing's been manifested. I pass my turn. So now it's my opponent's turn. He will draw two cards. First he will refresh. It's okay if you get that order mixed up, it happens sometimes. <laughs> um, now we move to the trade phase. So now it is up to my opponent what he wants to trade, because we no longer have any script on the trade here. We do recommend, though, that for a starting resource base, two tier ones, two tier twos, and one tier three will generally let you play most cards in your deck. All right, so I want to trade a greater for a greater. Okay, I will take that trade. My opponent wants to trade a greater for a greater. So, we each slide a tier 2. I have no idea what he's given me. He has no idea what I've given him. They go in our aspect stacks. And now, we move to the next phase. Seize phase, which we skip because we traded. Now we move to the resource phase. So we can choose which one he wants to put into play. So he's putting a greater aspect into play or a tier 2. Um, you can use the terms interchangeably. It's whatever. <laughs> Alright, so now we move to the summoning phase. My opponent can choose what they want to play. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to do... I'm going to summon nothing this turn. Ooh, my opponent is choosing to summon nothing. Now, that is an important thing to keep note of because schemes are abilities that can be used on either person's turn. So, my opponent might be setting something up for me to suffer some sort of ailment on my turn and leaving his resources open to do so. That is definitely a tactic you can use in this game. Combat phase. 
my opponent chooses what he wants to do with combat. Oh, I will definitely do that. I'm yep. going to go ahead and attack your life stack with my reflection of Ishtar. Okay, so my opponent has declared he is attacking my life stack with his reflection of Ishtar. I will choose to block with my Dragon's Tooth Soldier because I want to keep my Borderland Scout alive because it has stealth and it can attack. So we'll see what happens. So when resolving combat, um, so I have declared defenders. After we declare defenders, you can replace defenders if someone sacrificed to get rid of a defender. The only exception to that is if they're using a mini card defender, which is explained more in the rules. After uh, defenders are declared, now we resolve creature damage first. So the Reflection of Ishtar deals its four damage to my Dragon's Tooth Soldier, which will kill it. My Dragon's Tooth Soldier deals one damage in return, which puts a damage marker on the Reflection of Ishtar. Then the Ref Dragon's Tooth Soldier goes to the discard stack. Next phase of combat is resolve damage to discard stacks. Since no creatures attack the discard stack, nothing happened. Last phase of combat is resolve damage to life stacks. Now, even though the Reflection of Ishtar killed my Dragon's Tooth Soldier, it doesn't get to do any damage to my life stack because it doesn't have the keyword overrun. If a creature is blocked, it won't deal any damage unless it has the keyword overrun, in which case it will deal its remaining life and damage to whatever its initial target was. So I've successfully protected my life stack by sacrificing my Dragon's Tooth Soldier. Combat phase is ended, we move to end phase. There is nothing to resolve as there's no effects or cards manifested, so now it is my turn. Refresh phase, I will refresh my tier one. I will draw my two cards. Um, I will move to the trade phase. I will choose not to trade this turn. I feel like I have plenty of resources. I have three turns worth of resources to get into play, and I want to keep the cards in my hand. So during my resource phase, I will put out a tier two resource and then I am going to exhaust a tier one resource to play a Stoic Legionnaires, which is a two fight, one life creature that has initiative. Now initiative means that it strikes first in combat. So next turn, if my opponent attacks with the Reflection of Ishtar and I block with my Stoic Legionnaires, it will deal its two damage first, which would be enough to kill the Reflection of Ishtar, and this would take no damage in return. Initiative is a fairly powerful keyword. In addition, my Stoic Legionnaires also have the ability, when you summon this card, you may manifest one tier one. So now you're going to see the manifesting mechanic. I'm going to choose the bottom tier one because I remember what cards I traded my opponent. I am setting a trap. So the bottom tier one says, we, met, we resolved what happens in the black heresy box on the bottom. So in this case, it says manifesting player restores two. I am the manifesting player as the person who flipped the card face up. He is the controlling player as the person who has the card in front of him. Sometimes the manifesting player and controlling player could be the same. For example, if he manifested that card, he would be both the manifesting player and the controlling player. This is an important distinction that will come into play on other cards. So resolving this, I get to restore two. Restore is the mechanic by which cards go from your discard stack back underneath your life stack. Now in this case, since I only have one card, this is going to be the only one coming back. If I had more than two cards, I would turn them face down, I would shuffle them all together to randomize it, I would ask my opponent to cut, then I would deal off the top two. That way I don't know what I'm getting back, but I get to see them before they come back. This keeps players from choosing restore mechanics over and over and over again, which would make the game take forever. Kind of sucks. So my Dragon's Tooth Soldier goes back underneath. That resolves that effect. This remains face up until the end of the turn. It can still be exhausted to provide power, and it is now time for me to take the rest of my turn. I have nothing else to play from my hand, so I will move to the combat phase. I will declare attackers. This can't attack as it just came in. I will declare my Borderland Scout, an attacker, against my opponent's life stack. Does my opponent have a response? I do not. Okay, so the Borderland Scout comes through. We resolve creature damage. There's no creature damage to be done. Resolve discard stack damage. No discard stack damage to be done. Resolve life stack damage. Since I have dealt one damage, one card flips off the top. It is a Herald of Mars. A big card, but we'll see if my opponent has plans. So now we move to the end phase. Um, any manifested cards flip back face down, then get randomized. So that flips back face down, and then those will be shuffled together. So that way I don't know where they're at, and then my opponent won't know where they're at. And that's to keep people from manifesting the same card over and over and over again. Because what we found in playtesting was that once you manifest a restore card, generally everyone will then manifest that restore card. <laughs> so you need to kind of keep people guessing. All right. Ah, so my opponent is going to make a play during my end phase. So if this is a scheme, he is allowed to do that because schemes can be played at any time. So I'm going to do Flaming Arrows. All right, so my opponent plays Flaming Arrows, which is a scheme that costs two tier one resources or two lesser aspects. He has exhausted those two to provide.
over, the scheme hits the field, and now we resolve its effects. Now the first effect on it is the keyword savagery. What savagery means is that if you as a player have dealt damage to yourself earlier that turn, you get whatever is listed after the savagery trigger. In this case, manifest one tier two. However, because my opponent has not dealt damage to himself earlier this turn, we ignore what it says after savagery because he has not met the preconditions. Now we move to the next line of the card. That says, inflict two damage, split as desired, to one player's creatures, then inflict one damage to one player. So, my opponent has two damage to split how he chooses. He can do one and one, he can do two and two for whatever reason, but he's probably going to do one and one to kill both my creatures. One and one. one. Alright, so both my Borderland Scout and my Stoic Legionnaires die. A grievous loss. In return... We also now do the second part of the card, which is inflict one damage to one player. Now you'll notice a lot of red cards have this ability on their schemes and on other effects, because what that allows you to do is hit your savagery trigger. So if this was later in the game and he wanted to combo this with another card, he might do the one damage to yourself. However, since this is the early game, I am probably going to be the one suffering that damage. So I take one damage to my life stack, flips over a captive wyvern. Now you'll note the captive wyvern has a deathbound effect Place this card on the bottom of your life stack. But Deathbound only triggers when a card goes from the combat field to the discard stack. Deathbound does not trigger from the life stack to the discard stack. So unfortunately, my Captive Wyvern is stuck inside the discard stack unless I can find a way to get it back. Okay, that card is finished resolving. It goes to my opponent's discard stack. My end phase is done. Now it is my opponent's turn. So, he essentially just took his turn on my turn, which is something you absolutely can do. It just means you saved all your resources in order to be able to do that. So, refresh phase. There we go. Draw phase. And then trade phase. Okay, so my opponent thinks he's in a pretty good spot right now. I mean, he's got a Reflection of Ishtar out, he's got a Sand Dune, he's got some pretty good resources, and I've got nothing. So, this is where you start seeing kind of the competitive side of the game start to take place. It will only get worse from here. <laughs> Alright, so resource phase. My opponent will put a Tier 2 resource into play, giving him two Lessers and two Graders. He will exhaust both Lessers and both Graders in order to put out an Assyrian Sphinx, which is a creature with three fight, three life, and the keyword fleet. What fleet means is that creatures with fleet can only be blocked by other creatures with fleet or creatures with entrapment. They're either too fast or too wily to be trapped by normal means. Okay, combat phase. So, on my combat turn, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have my Reflection of Ishtar attack your life stack. Alright, so the Reflection of Ishtar is coming into my life stack. Now this is going to hit me for only two damage because it has taken one wound counter. Normally, it would be three, but since damage is permanent and damage dealt to players is based on a creature's current life, this will only deal two damage. I could sacrifice to get rid of this card, but that would leave me at a huge resource disadvantage and I probably wouldn't be able to play a lot from my hand, so I have no choice but to let it get through. So it swings in, deals two damage to my life stack, two more cards, flip over. Okay. Uh, in phase, nothing to resolve. Now it is my turn. So I refresh. I draw my cards. Um, I decide that I don't really want to. I don't really want to trade. I'm going to put out a tier two aspect. I will exhaust one tier one to play another Stoic Legionnaires, thus allowing me to manifest one tier one. Um, I'll try the top one. Let's see if I get lucky. So I don't know which one is which here. So I got heal again. I get to restore two cards. So I take my life stack, or my discard stack, I turn it over, I shuffle the cards, I hand it to my opponent to cut, and then I deal the top two off. Now that these cards that come back are common knowledge, as well as the discard stack. You can always choose to look at cards in the discard stack at any time. So I get back my Stoic Legionnaires and my Captive Wyvern. They go underneath the deck in the order I choose. So those are back. Now, in addition, I will also exhaust one tier one and two tier twos to play a Shade of Thanatos, which is a four fight, two life creature with fleet, so it can block the Assyrian Sphinx, they can fight each other, and it also has the ability to exhaust and flick damage on one player equal to this card's current life value. Remember, creatures can exhaust the turn they come into play, so if I wanted to, I could immediately exhaust this to deal two damage to my opponent. However, that would mean I couldn't block his Assyrian Sphinx, so I'm gonna leave this fresh right now just in case he decides to attack with the Sphinx. Uh, combat phase. Both my creatures came in, I cannot attack. So, 
I will move to the end phase. Heal gets flipped back over. Cards get randomized. And we are done with the end phase. So now it is my opponent's turn. Refresh phase. Draw phase for two cards. There we go. Uh, trade phase. All right, I don't think I'm gonna do the trade. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. So you'll find as as the game progresses, uh, you'll be much less likely to trade each other because you feel like you have a resource base built up. And that's where seizing comes into play. Uh, we'll, we might get into seizing on next turn. We'll see what happens. <laughs> All right, so my opponent puts a tier three into play. Tier threes are the most powerful of the resources. They are exalted aspects. Generally, they allow you the ability to play very powerful cards. However, the flip side is that they tend to do very bad things to you if they get re manifested on your side of the field. So tier threes are always a double-edged sword. You want them, but they're also risky. Summoning phase. My opponent is exhausting all of his resources to put out a Cataphracts of the Sand. Now they are a 4 fight, 4 life creature with Overrun, which means that when they swing in, whenever combat after combat damage is resolved, they get to do their remaining life in damage to whatever their initial target was. I'm going to be in trouble if those hit me, because they also have the ability, once per turn, if this card attacks, you must refresh it and immediately take a second attack with it. So they can potentially do up to 8 damage in a turn. That's a lot of damage in this game. Alright, uh, combat phase. These two can attack, this one just came in so it cannot. Let's see. I think I'm not going to attack this turn. Probably a wise choice. My opponent has decided not to attack because I can put my Stoic Legionnaires in front of that, and my Shade of Thanatos in front of that, and since this has Deathbound manifest 1 tier 3, he would have to manifest a tier 3, and the only one in play is on his side. Aspects in the Aspect stack are not in play, they cannot be manifested, they cannot be messed around with in any means or fashion. They're kind of waiting there for you to do something with them. So, my opponent does not attack, and we move to the end phase. Now during the end phase, I have a response. I'm going to exhaust my Shade of Thanatos to deal 2 damage to my opponent, and there is nothing he can do about it. Uh, haha. Now we move to my turn. So refresh phase. My cards refresh. I draw my two cards. Um, I will choose not to trade. I'll put. Uh, no, actually, I'm gonna seize. Let's let's show the seize mechanic. So, I want a. Do you have any tier threes in your hand? So my opponent has a tier three in hand. So normally I could say, would you like to trade a tier three for a tier three? But if my opponent said, no, I don't want to trade, then I could be like, well. You know, I really want that tier 3. So, in this case, we'll pretend my opponent doesn't want to trade. So he says, no trades, I'm done with the trade phase. So I'm like, okay, well then I'm going to seize that tier 3. So, I need to ditch 5 cards out of my hand, one of which will be destroyed. So I will destroy this card, it is gone from the game permanently. These 4 go into my discard stack, and I get to seize that tier 3 and put it in my aspect stack. You'll notice this has left me with very few options left in my hand. I only have two cards left. However, if I have something that can make use of that second tier 3, maybe that's a reason why I wanted to, to do it. Um, my resource phase, I will put this tier 3 into play, and then I will exhaust 1 tier 1 and 2 tier 2s for a second shade of Thanatos. So my side of the field is starting to get pretty beefy. I've, I've got some stuff out here that I can be like, ooh, I'm going to start blowing things up. Now, combat phase, I do not want to attack. A, because he has the sand dune. B, because I'm trying to protect myself. So I will um, move to the end phase. I have nothing to do, so now it is my opponent's turn. So my opponent refreshes. My opponent will draw two cards. Let's see. Now we move to the trade phase. Now, one thing about seizing, if you seize from your opponent during the next trade phase, they can do what's called a force trade, which means they can take a card from their hand, force it to you as a trade, and then get back an equivalent aspect from the topmost one in your life stack. So that's useful for if someone takes something from you and then you absolutely want them to have a specific trap in return, you force trade it back to them and you get that equivalent resource in your aspect stack. So, would you like to force trade? 
Well, I don't have any in my hand. Uh, so, so you can't. No, but you know what? I have a funny feeling there's a reason you're keeping that card in your hand. So I think I'm going to seize against you. Oh, no. So my opponent, seeing that I only have one tier three in my hand, has decided he wants to take it. He might not even need this resource, but he knows that he is taking it out of my hand, thus leaving me with very few options. Actually, no options. So my opponent discards five cards, one of which is permanently destroyed. There we go. And then he gets that face down in his aspect stack. Now let's check conviction real quick. Yep, you still have conviction. So the reason I was checking what color his cards were, in this game, there is a special ability called Conviction, visible on the God card as this series of linked chains. What that means is that if all your cards in play, as well as all your cards in your discard stack, are the same color as your God, you get whatever is listed after Conviction. If a single card of another color is in play or in your discard stack, your conviction is broken. You must find a way to either restore this or get it out of the game in order to get conviction again. Gods are very jealous. They reward those who are passionately loyal to them. All right, so now we move to the resource phase. My opponent can put a, has to put the tier three in play, because that's what he has available. And now we move to the summoning phase. Let's see, I don't think I'm gonna summon anything this turn. All right. I think we're gonna go straight to the Straight to combat. Now, here is an area where my opponent can win the game, and we're going to show you a high-level series of plays as to how that will happen. My opponent, you will want to attack my life stack with your Cataphracts of the Sand. All right, I'll go ahead and do that. Boom, they're coming in, a 4-4 with Overrun. So I want to block with my Shade of Thanatos, because I feel like, okay, yeah, I'll lose my Shade of Thanatos, but that's going to prevent the Cataphracts of the Sand from dealing massive damage to my life stack. However, you have your once per game deity power of Mars, which is once per game after defenders are declared, you may give one of your creatures initiative until end of turn. Initiative allows them to strike first in combat. So the Cataphracts of the Sand now have initiative. The second part, the conviction bonus, you do get because all your cards in play as well as all the cards in your discard stack are the same color as your god. So the conviction effect is you inflict three damage to all other players, one damage to yourself, thus also making it a savage retrigger. So I take one, two, three damage from that. You take one damage and your god flips over to let you know that the deity power has been used, also allowing you to see the really cool full artwork on the back of the card. So resolve creature damage. Cataphracts of the Sand, since they have initiative, strike first. They deal four damage, which kills the Shade of Thanatos outright, goes into my discard stack. Now we resolve discard stack damage, nothing attacking discard stack, now life stack damage. Because the Cataphracts of the Sand have overrun, they deal their remaining life and damage to their initial target, which was my life stack. So I'm taking four damage. One, two, three, four. Ow, that hurt. Now Cataphracts of the Sand get to use their special ability, where they must refresh and attack again this turn. So they refresh and they attack again, declaring the life stack. You got it. This time, I'm going to block with my Stoic Legionnaires, because I know my Stoic Legionnaires have initiative, so at least that way they can deal two points of damage before they die, thus saving me two points of life. However, my opponent has access to the Sacrifice mechanic. So my opponent's going to sacrifice one Tier 1 to get rid of my Stoic Legionnaires. Got it. So they were defending, now they're destroyed. They are gone from the game, this resource is gone from the game. It comes back to me because I traded it to him. Now, there is a step in the combat phase where you can replace defenders for precisely this scenario. However, if I replace my Shade of Thanatos in there, because this still has initiative, the same thing is going to happen to this Shade of Thanatos as what happened to the last Shade of Thanatos. So there's really no reason for me to do that. So unfortunately, Cataphracts of the Sand are going to come through, deal their full four damage. One, two, three, four to me, leaving me with three life. So I won't be quite dead on the draw. However, my opponent, knowing the tier three that he traded to me, wants to win the game this turn. He doesn't want to give me any chance to pull any shenanigans with these last couple cards. So here's where the super high level play comes in. He knows on his Assyrian Sphinx, it has the deathbound trigger manifest to tier three. He knows what this tier three is because he traded to me early in the game. However, he really doesn't have a way to kill this. He can't really play a card from his hand to kill it. Um, and the combat phase is already over, so he has to find another way. 
enter the sacrifice mechanic. If my opponent sacrifices one tier one and two tier twos to blow up my shade of Thanatos, boom, boom, so those are out of the game, this is out of the game. Now all of a sudden, his creature limit for tier one and tier two creatures is zero. Both of these die. Both of them have a death bound effect. This is a manifest one tier three. This is manifest one tier one. And if you control a sand dune, manifest one tier two. So he gets to manifest one tier one, one tier two, and one tier three in the order that he chooses. So he will want to choose to manifest the one tier three first because he knows what this card is. That's what I'm gonna do. So my opponent manifests this tier three, which is total war, an epic aggression scheme that when it is manifested, manifesting player deals seven damage to all other players, then two damage to themselves. The seven damage goes first, one, two, three, and I am dead, GG, sir. GG. Now, timing operations matter here because if he had only had two cards left in his life stack, so if these were the only two cards left in there, he would have dealt the seven damage first, killing me, the game would be over before he had to deal the two damage to himself. So, remember, the order of operations on cards is important, and you do them in the order that they are listed. You must resolve the full effects of the first part before you move on to another part. So, that is Twilight of the Gods. That is a demo game. And yeah, hopefully you will join us in playing, and uh, it's a lot of fun, I promise you that.